Um, and I am also, now that the recording is in progress, uh, will notify you that we are recording all these uh, sessions. Uh, many of you, uh, many of the people that are interested uh, are in different time zones uh, and many are not able to join at this particular time. So, so for their benefit and for our own kind of learning benefit, we, it's ho we hope that that's okay to, to be recording these sessions. Um, and in terms of the structure of the session, um, we will hear from Pia first uh, with a bit of a follow-up from Jeff uh, in terms of a reflection and a question. Then we'll um, return that order and Jeff will present and then Pia will reflect. And then we'll pick, there'll be some time uh, for discussion, Q&A. Uh, so don't hold back uh, in terms of sharing your questions in the chat as we go along. Uh, we'll try to pick them up uh, and make sure that that um, that they be they'll be asked uh, in in some way or form. Certainly, in the end, hopefully, we have time for for a, a bit of a conversation uh, as well. Um, but without further ado, I think we'll we'll hand it over uh, to Pia to kick us off. Um, over to you, Pia. Uh, thank you so much for having me and, and thank you everyone. I want to just take a moment to acknowledge traditional owners of the land that I am standing on. I'm in um, Bornake, uh, Wellington uh, in um, Aotearoa, New Zealand. And so the traditional owners here, of course, are the Māori people from right across the land. Um, I was so privileged and delighted to be uh, invited to, to share this, this keynote uh, session. Um, and at first I, I was a little uh, confused, you know, why institutional innovation um, when it seems so obvious, but then it is uh, interesting to reflect on the fact that, that uh, there are still those that think that um, everything's cool. Uh, yes, there'll always be challenges, there'll always be trends, there'll always be new things to deal with, but fundamentally our, our structures and processes and um, ways of working are, are sufficient. And I guess the big realisation I've had over the years is it absolutely isn't. So I'm going to, uh, I've got a bit of a bit of a deck to go through um, and I've got some thoughts to share with you all about uh, why I think um, uh, institutional innovation is uh, is not optional and, um, and certainly not um, uh, something that should be uh, even in question. So the short version, the TLDR, is to create trustworthy, adaptive and humane public services that are actually fit for the 21st century. Uh, all of our um, different governments in many of our countries, not all, but many countries, uh, our governance systems and our government, government systems were built in the uh, industrial era, uh, were built um, before, well before the internet, well before globalization, well before um, the impact and advent of um, serious digital uh, digitization, digital um, uh, evolution and revolution of, uh, of our societies, economies, how we work, play, uh, connect, etc. And before some major um, uh, paradigm shifts that have happened over the last few decades. Um, the key, but I want to start actually with the urgent challenges facing us. So there are many, there's always urgent challenges, but I see three fundamental uh, challenges that um, that demand innovation, demand change and transformation. The first one, of course, is mass misinformation. Um, people are being people and communities are being gamed. Um, trust, truth, and authenticity are at risk more than ever before, and um, and it's only getting worse. Um, I'll, I'll jump into that uh, in just a moment. The second one is rolling emergencies, uh, whether they are uh, health, environmental, cultural, uh, economic, um, we are seeing more and more emergencies happening. And um, uh, traditionally, a, a lot of our uh, sectors would rely on uh, emergency powers to get us through. But the fact that we have to rely on emergency powers so much uh, demonstrates that our systems are not adaptive, are not uh, responsive and resilient um, as they are. And so we should really be asking the question, how can we are not able to respond um, at speed and in pace with uh, the emergencies happening around us um, with the powers that we have without having to always resort to emergency powers. And the final one, which I think is well understood, but often um, uh, seen as less urgent, even though I think I would argue that the urgency has now got to a point of uh, social disruption is the um, dramatically growth, dramatic growth in inequity um, between um, not just the haves and have nots, but the connected and the disconnected between the rich and the poor, et cetera. 
Uh, so I'll, I'll talk briefly about these three and then I'll talk about the three characteristics that I see for a modern um, uh, public sector and the types of innovation that are necessary to get us there. So first of all, I can tell you the moment, uh, the first moment that I felt genuine fear, uh, genuine fear about um, our societies, about um, what's to come. And that was when I saw this video. I won't play the audio on it, uh, but um, this is a uh, very famous now deep fake video that was produced, uh, I think a year or so ago actually. And it was um, a series of deep fakes made by, you know, that used uh, the Tom Cruise's uh, face and uh, done in real time. We are now entering an, an era where anyone can be um, displayed as showing and saying anything. And, uh, and the reason that that's so scary is because it's not just about um, uh, being able to tell truth from fiction anymore. Um, it's not just about the impact that that will have on trust, on truth, on elections, um, but also uh, it will, it will, you know, we're, we're very, very close to a point where anyone can be blackmailed by fake videos, <laughs> where anyone um, can be generated in a fake video where you might be talking to someone uh, over video conferencing, particularly with more and more virtualized workforces internationally, and how do you know it's actually a person? So um, this is going to have a, a dramatic um, and, and much worse impact on uh, social cohesion and um, uh, public confidence and public um, um, trust than, uh, than even, even our worst nightmares at this point in time. So th this is why this scared me so much. So it actually led me to write uh, uh, some papers and submissions to the government here in New Zealand about, um, about how, to, uh, how the public sector could play a stronger role in supporting uh, truth and authenticity for, um, you know, in collaboration with the, uh, with the population, but it is um, definitely a major issue facing us. Uh, the second, uh, the next one is getting ready for a state of perpetual emergencies. So a lot of governments around the world are uh, preparing for and presuming uh, continuous emergencies now. Um, those, um, uh, the, the, when you start to assume uh, perpetual change and perpetual emergencies, you start to shift how you work. It starts to create a, a pressure, um, which isn't just, you know, the latest thing coming from the minister or the government of the day, but, um, but how do you know that something's happening before it's become mainstream, because before it's, it's hit um, that tipping point? How do we shift our, our governments and our public sector to be more uh, responsive, more um, detecting of changes that's happening, and more contextualized to to uh, to the world around us, not just sort of uh, in our in our bubble, measuring what um, uh, we need to measure for that particular service or policy. Um, understanding that this is a, a key urgent issue is um, is is important because it helps plan um, uh, some of that transformation that we need. And the final one, of course, is inequity. Um, when enough people suffer. Uh, society itself becomes less sustainable, the economy becomes less sustainable, all of the presumptions about um, um, stable stability become a little bit threatened. And then when we start looking at the shift in technology um, into that, uh, I, you know, um, can can predict here today um, that, uh, and this has been coming for some time, that one of the next big social fractures that we will see will actually be around um, human augmentation. There will be parts of society that are very comfortable to augment themselves with technology, um, whether it's be, you know, to, to have two more legs so you can run really fast or climb really fast or, or to start, you know, getting into um, cyborg style, you know, accelerations uh, of self um, or, you know, it, it's getting away from technology as a way to get back to normal, you know, you lose a leg, you replace it with another leg, and it's starting to get into augmentation beyond what the scope it is it means to be human in some people's eyes. Whereas other parts of society will be absolutely stuck on, um, and, and not for any bad reason, on what it means to be human. And that fragmentation will be a very interesting thing to, uh, uh, to be a part of, and it's definitely gonna happen in our lifetimes. So we've got this pressure exponentially growing. We've got speed and complexity exponentially growing. We've got emergencies, exponentially growing, I would suggest. Our capacity to respond in most public sectors is reasonably linear. What that means is that we are seeing an exponentially growing needs gap. And that needs gap for me is the, um, is the, is the key reason 
why we need to uh, uh, why we need to innovate. And the people are feeling it today. You know, people don't know if something's true. They don't know if a video is uh, fake or real. They don't know what's genuine. They, they can't tell if they're being gamed. And then it starts to get really disturbing when you start thinking about, you know, IIT data. How do I know that the IIT data that's being fed into my emergency response plan has not been tampered with? How do I know that the robot is um, uh, prioritizing human outcomes, not just the economic uh, incentives? Um, and when people get told computer says no, how do they know what they're eligible for? How do they appeal it? How do they um, have a sense of agency and social justice in a highly automated world? Well, to answer a lot of this, the key reason why we need to innovate our institutions, our public institutions, is because we need to evolve. We need not just to avoid the impending icebergs that we can see, uh, but we also need to have a vehicle which is more fit for purpose for the 21st century. We need a vehicle that can be more adaptive, that can go in different terrains. So I'm going to talk to you about the three characteristics that I see for a modern public service. Uh, they are trustworthy, adaptive and human. So trustworthy institutions are explainable, testable, um, they're accountable uh, and more open. Uh, when, when we take a decision, when we take an action, um, the, the, the legal, administrative legal basis of that decision should be communicated to the person. They should be able to easily find any decisions about them and, and, um, and see what basis they were made on and be able to even appeal them. Uh, we need to be reliable for people. If we say we're going to do something, we should do it. If we make a service available, it should be available. We, we shouldn't have um, the fundamental aspects of our, our public sectors uh, not being um, perceived as fully reliable. We need to be perceived as, and in reality, a steward for good. It's not just about the most efficient way of doing something today or saving a few bucks tomorrow or a small iterative shift in this direction or that direction. We need to be stewards for long-term sustainable public good, regardless of the government of the day. Uh, that is the role of the public service. The public service needs to see itself as part of society, not separate to society. That separation between civil service and public service that, um, and in some countries, no um, civil service per se, um, the, uh, but just public service, that, that lack of um, sense of being part of society, but rather separate from society, uh, and has led to, um, uh, you know, the only interaction the department has with the general public is generally through a marketing arm. Why can't the professional public servants be engaging with the public on all aspects of the work? Well, quite often it's because you have to go through the marketing people to do it. And how do we create more participatory institutions, participatory policy, participatory services, participatory interventions to solve problems? Often the by co-designing uh, data-driven everything will give you um, trends, will give you an understanding of opportunities or of problems or of risks, but it will never give you the solution. If we can start to co-create and co-design and then uh, uh, solutions with the communities affected, then we can start to get uh, more trustworthy outcomes. How do we create adaptive institutions? Well, by becoming more agile and test-driven, by becoming more, not just focused on evidence-based policy, but experimentation-based policy to complement that, uh, by creating multidisciplinary teams so that we're not building um, solutions in isolation of all of the different disciplines that can feed into that. Uh, in fact, um, that, that top diagram here is actually from the Canadian School of Public Service. And it's one of my favorite because it has policy and implementation as part of the one continuum. And because it looks a bit like a pair of goggles. <laughs> they joke about don't become a policy pirate, you know, don't just look at policy, don't just look at implementation, recognize that it's all part of the one continuum and close that gap because until we actually close the gap between policy and delivery so that we can have not just adaptive services um, but adaptive regulation, adaptive legislation, adaptive policy positions that actually responds to continuous change in the environment around us and continuing change of the needs of the people and continuous change in um, the, the urgency around us. Um, we need to start building our policies and services and regulation to assume continuous ongoing change. And that doesn't, and, and the only way that you can be adaptive and responsive to ongoing change is to monitor for it, not just monitor for your policy objectives or your CX or your performance measures, but also just um, measuring and monitoring for uh, quality of life indicators. Because if you see a major shift and there's a statistical correlation to a new policy, then that's an important thing to be able to respond to. And again, participatory. We need to have uh, participatory institutions so that they can be adaptive. They can be responsive to changing values, changing needs and um, 
and can actually adapt to uh, the changes that are happening in the community. And finally, humane institutions, not just being user-centric, but being community-centric, not just uh, focused on efficiencies, but focused on values, focused on outcomes, um, but how, how we can be inclusive and welcoming. Um, the Service New South Wales and Service Canada, I've, I've had their privilege to work at both of those organisations, and I have to say they were both really special because they provided a holistic means of a person interacting with all of the services and supports that government can provide in a welcoming way. Welcome to Service New South Wales. How can I help you? Welcome to Service Canada. Have you also thought about this? Um, it, it's very different to anything else I've seen in New Zealand, in the federal government in Australia, in the UK, in most countries do not provide that. Estonia, of course, provides a very integrated service. Um, South Korea provides a very integrated service. But that, that concept of doing the hard work to make it easy for people and being welcoming of them and helpful to them is, is a really important part of being more humane. Measuring quality of life, um, creating a what a humans plus machines future looks like rather than humans or machines. And again, participatory. Why do I keep banging on about participatory? Because participatory governance must become our new norm. If it's not our new norm, then we are not going to be able to be, um, uh, not going to be able to be trustworthy, we're not going to be able to be adaptive, and we're not going to be able to be uh, humane. So here's a couple of examples of, of participatory democracy, but um, uh, we, we took the, the treaty here in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and used it as the basis for designing out a digital government, a digital framework, a digital public infrastructure approach. Um, there's a lot of amazing, amazing Indigenous um, frameworks to actually build around rather than just consulting with citizens as users per se or as certainly not as customers. I truly hate the term customers for people um, that are trying to interact with the government because it's not like they have a choice. Um, but, um, but there's a lot of frameworks that, you know, that don't put humans at the top of a ladder but just as part of a broader environment, country-centred design, um, culturally inclusive and culturally respectful design. And of course, Audrey Tang is, I think, the absolute, um, and, and the work that they're doing in, in Taiwan in that jurisdiction is, uh, I think, an absolute light on the hill and a bit of a moonshot for the rest of us in participatory governance. Um, so the, the exploring and understanding the participatory governance as a principle is absolutely critical, is something that we should all be considering in our own cultures, context, and uh, public sectors. Uh, the types of innovation I think can get us there um, range <laughs> from a from cultural uh, culture innovation. It's so critical that our um, our organisations focus on the people in it and empower them, build up that existential confidence, make sure it's uh, you have safe teams and supported teams that are um, given the support and encouragement, not just to uh, take decisions and to to use their expertise and be confident in that. But, um, but that we create in our programs and our planning the space and time and support for people to experiment. Service innovation, how we can be welcoming, policy innovation, administrative innovation, how we do um, budgeting. We're, we're doing sprint-based procurement, for instance, in a couple of jurisdictions I've worked in, which has been amazing. Shifting from project funding to service funding because, you know, a service is like a puppy and if you, you know, basically stop feeding it the moment you get it, then it's not going to live very long. Um, and shifting to uh, civic innovation and um, as a norm. Gov as a platform is a both a strategy and a philosophy. And the, the key concept there is that, you know, government can be that platform everyone can stand on so that we can all keep our heads above water. So um, thinking about everything you do as a, as a means of helping people stay above water is really critical. And then also looking at the types of innovation in terms of top down, bottom up, and exploring both areas of certainty and uncertainty. It's not about any one of these is fundamentally better than others, but we should be we should be doing all these top types of innovation. It can't just be top down because it doesn't scale. It can't just be bottom up because there's no moonshot. It can't just be in uncertainty because then you'd just be enhancing the status quo, but it can't just be in uncertainty. Otherwise you're not um, making your current systems more efficient. We need to be looking at and investing in all these forms of innovation. Final couple of points is Openness is not a choice. Uh, it's not a nice to have. It's not a philanthropic idea. It's critical because open that's not digital doesn't scale and digital that's not open doesn't last. Openness is the greatest means of creating highest impact, highest trust and highest public uh, engagement in and support for the work that we do in the public sector. Um, so we need to think very carefully. What 
do we need to keep and what do we need to discard as we transform ourselves, as we adopt innovation into our very DNA, which we've always been, you know, innovative uh, in many areas in the public service, but um, but adopting it as a strength of the public service, I think, is uh, a, a very critical aspect because we invented all of this. And if we don't take the moment to reinvent it when it's not quite working, then who will? If public servants don't, you know, create a better public service, then it's not going to ever get any better. So my final thought for you all is that um, why institutional innovation? Well, it's really quite simple because the people that we serve deserve better. They deserve better than what they have and they, they actually deserve better than what we're currently capable of. So I'll leave it there, but um, I hope that was a helpful kickoff for the session. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Piev. What a comprehensive and compelling case for in institutional innovation. Um, Jeff, uh, quick thoughts and a question from you. Well, I thought that was brilliant and didn't leave much to say. I, I certainly found all of that convincing. Um, maybe just one question, I mean, there are so many uh, prompted by it, but about where you started and where you ended about truth. Um, as you say, we're in this weird era when the boundaries of truth and falsehood are becoming more and more blurred. Uh, this is causing havoc to democracy, to you know how society works, to science, you name it. Um, and part of the problem there is that I think people in many countries, maybe not New Zealand, they don't really trust government to have any role in relation to truth. So in terms of institutional innovation, yes. Sorry, Jeff. Uh, um, reinforce truth against lies, falsehood, etc. You know, where, where... Jeff, sorry. Um, no, I, I, I caught that. You, you caught that. Okay, great. Yep. Sorry. Um, thanks very much, Jeff, and I, I really appreciate that it's a, a very important topic to drill in on. So, first of all, I do think most people want government, want the public sector to be able to be relied upon for certain truths. They want to know that the weather data is true weather data. They want to know that the statistical information is true to statistical information. They want to know that the notices from the police are true. Um, and I think that people rely upon uh, the public sector to provide all kinds of facts and data um, upon which they can then build, if you like, their truth uh, every day. And so part of the challenge, uh, which you um, you sort of touched upon, but, um, but it's, it's so rarely said aloud, is, um, is the intersection between the public service and the government, where politics um, is seen to be entwined with the public sector, then the general public loses trust in the public sector. So the more politically neutral that the public sector can position itself, the more it is able to engender trust. People should be able to trust the public service, even if they um, almost by definition are going to distrust politicians at some point because the side that they voted for isn't doesn't happen to be in at some point in time. Um, so the key thing for me is um, the public service um, being itself trustworthy means reimagining a few things. Uh, there has been a lot of work to, to figure out what the social license is and, and what the public appetite is for, you know, for data sharing for these kinds of things. But rather than asking or begging for trust, the public service should actually be setting itself up to be more trustworthy. Rather than saying, here's how we could use your data, the, the public service could be saying, um, how do you want your data to be used? Uh, so I, I think that there's a shift in the narrative for the public service to actually build a direct relationship with the public better as it, as it has in the past before in some of our jurisdictions it got as politicized as it has. Um, and then the final part of that, of course, is nothing will combat misinformation at the scale that we are seeing it and that we will continue to see it moving forward. Uh, if you want to read a really um, disturbing book, I think it's the latest, um, I think William Gibson one called The Fall is about just the misinformation gets so bad that the entire internet sort of um, and online, everything sort of breaks down. It's a very interesting hypothesis. Um, but if people have points of, um, of where they can trust uh, the NGOs, their local community groups, their local church, uh, their local iwi or marae, 
um, then, um, then that helps. And so if government can provide, if you like, means of being able to, um, uh, to, to assure at least official information, if you're in an emergency and, the, and you get a text saying, run to this address here to get help, and you don't know if, if it's true or not, you know, we suddenly get people very, very stuck and, and, and in genuine danger. So being able to know that they have a, and being able to provide means of assuring at least official information would be a really good, really good um, role for the government to play, but also, and, and for the public service more specifically to play. And if the public service can reach out to people and say, how can we help? In, in different jurisdictions, they'll get a different answer, but at least it becomes part of that participatory governance. Uh, the role of, of uh, the public sector, I think necessarily needs to change over time. And so what role should it play as an institution, which is publicly accountable um, and publicly um, um, held to account? <laughs> um, there, there are certain things that the public service should be able to do in society, uh, or at least in the sort of societies that several of your um, participants are coming from. Um, having said that, in some countries, they will always be seen as, nope, get the government out of my face. I want to do it all myself. That's fine. But, um, but in countries where the citizens want and people want to be able to rely on the, the public service, then we should be having those conversations about how can we help you navigate the, um, the, the challenges of, of today. We can't just keep putting the onus on people to figure it out for themselves. We need to figure out how to help. Thank you, thank you, Pierre, and and, um, and maybe that there is a, a couple of segments. Maybe just one short follow-up question. Yeah, um, definitely. I'll turn off my camera in a moment. I was going to say, I'm going to switch off my little angle to this. However, governments need to become actually more aggressive. Sorry, Text I think I just lost. Sorry, Jeff. Yeah, yeah. Know. Whether they need to become more uh, aggressive and proactive. So you mentioned Taiwan, where on disinformation, actually the government has been much more trying to engage on social media with the disinformers. In Europe, in relation to Russian interference in elections, you know, do governments need to counterattack? So, in a sense, I, I agree with everything you said about, in a sense, ensuring the reliability of government information. But there may need to be actually a rather very different style of operation, which is more combative for truth. And at the moment, we don't have any institutions to do that. Um, so that that would be my question. <laughs> is that right? No, I think there's definitely scope there to explore. Um, I guess the, the two things I'd say is I think that public service, public sectors in, uh, inherently becoming more proactive is critical because too many departments and too many teams across departments are at 100% capacity doing the same old thing. And while if you have everyone at 100% capacity doing, you know, dealing with the latest emergency or the latest urgency, there's no speculative planning, there's no future planning, there's no capacity for looking um, around the next bends, let alone uh, raising your eyes to the horizon and walking in a different direction. So it's absolutely critical to free up some capacity. And if you've got a, you know, if you've got one dollar or a billion dollars, freeing up a proportion of your capacity to actually become more proactive is critical. And then the second thing I'd say is um, rather than trying to just make it up, and just imagine, here's what, what I think we should do. It, you know, just figuring out with the people, you know, um, and then, as I said, it will be different in different communities across different countries in different contexts, but just reaching out and trying to co-create, we are all facing a new problem, public servants as a citizens too, as much as sometimes that likes to be forgotten. Um, how, but, but how can the, the public service and uh, engage with proactively people uh, to to actually help them navigate this world, uh, it needs to be a co-developed and co-designed thing, particularly taking into account that a lot of uh, minority and Indigenous communities are um, targeted <laughs> uh, very much from some of this misinformation and, um, and uh, fears are preyed upon um, either by people or organisations, but um, even more increasingly by bots uh, that 
you know, just to take in the soft targets. Uh, so, um, so engaging with different and the diversity across whatever your country is uh, to, uh, to build those and to co-design and co-implement those mechanisms that will support people to, um, uh, to have confidence and trust and to at least have those mechanisms to, um, to maybe fact check uh, certain things would be very helpful. Um, and, um, and, and that, can, that can then be part of it. You know, no one wants to be fooled. No one wants to be um, manipulated. Um, and, um, but right now, how would you know? Thank you, Pierre. Um, I think, uh, the, at least to my, my knowledge, there's several great segues into to Jeff's work, uh, just, uh, just in that comment alone. So Jeff, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, hand it over to you. Uh, just uh, also encouraging the, the group here to start asking questions in the chat. Um, maybe even Jeff and Pierre can kind of pick them up as they go along, uh, or we, we will certainly try to bring them into discussion. Over to you, Jeff, and, and hopefully the connection on your end uh, will allow us to, to hear you properly. Okay, well, I, I've switched off my camera. I'm in central London, so my <laughs> signal is not very good, which is a bit weird. Um, and I, I, I'll just not talk too long, but I, I really like the, being given this question to think about institutional uh, innovation. Um, because although sometimes within governments, the temptation to create new structures and shuffle the deck and reorganize can be a distraction, uh, sometimes you do need the forms of the state to fit with the functions. And if there's one big lesson I guess I've learned as a bureaucrat is that if you want something to happen, you need to make it part of someone's job. And if you want it to continue to happen, it's best to embed it in an institution rather than as a one-off program. So the kind of exam question I'll spend the next seven or eight minutes on is, imagine you were creating a government from scratch in 2022, you know, what would you actually do? Uh, how would you organize it? What would be the structure? So here's just a few sort of thoughts. Uh, and I think these are hopefully very much echo what Pia said. First, there's a series of new tasks, which almost all governments have, which they don't quite have institutions fitted for. The most obvious one with COP26 happening not that far from where I am is net zero. What kind of governance structures do you need to track carbon emissions, to support different fields from buildings, to transport, to big industries, to cut their carbon emissions, uh, and, and so on. And it's a very different set of tasks, I think, to classic environment departments and the sort of skills they had. So that's a very live one. There's another one which is about new social needs. If you're prioritizing mental health as opposed to physical health, actually that requires quite different structures of, of governance, of, um, of provision of support in communities, in families, self-help, and so on, than a health system focused on a physical health or a classic uh, welfare state. Here in the UK and in many other countries, we've got a chronic position on care for the elderly and a complete absence of good institutions uh, to handle that. And many have long made the case for a new kind of national care service to sit alongside the national health service. That at least might be a starting point. And then within that, how does it organize um, uh, the training, the status, the, the knowledge of the people working in it. There's a whole host of missing regulators we have now. Um, most obviously around artificial intelligence, we have a sort of quasi-regulator here in the, called the CDEI. China's just creating ones uh, across the EU. New regulators have to be set up as a consequence of this year's new legislation but they're filling a, a, a pretty vacant space and we'll have to grapple with many of the issues Pierre talked about, like how much can you explain decisions made by an algorithm? And I think we have a whole set of missing institutions around protection, protection from cyber attacks and all the issues we were just talking about in relation to protection from uh, mistruth, uh, misinformation, disinformation, and so on. And the thought of, yeah, the deep fake released two days before an election uh, um, is one which really worries me. And I think we, we need, as I say, new public institutions to guard us. 
there's then a whole series of sort of design questions about how any new institution should work suited to how the world works now rather than how it worked 50 years ago. What needs to be built into the DNA of institutions? And here's just a, a, a few uh, unfinished thoughts to, to, to follow what Jesper said. I think one field we really need rethinking is around money and the organization of money within government. And I did a previous session for States of Change on some work I've been doing on this and how you reorient public finance to uh, longer term goals, link it more clearly to data and impact. And one you know, logic that takes you towards is actually entities within governments, which look a bit more like banks and investors, but in the best sense, tying allocation of funds to impacts over time and accountability for those impacts. I think there's a lot which could be changed for the better there. Pia mentioned procurement, new models of procurement, which are more agile, more sprint-based, more open, clearly useful. We have a whole series of scandals in the UK at the moment about bad and corrupt uh, procurement. In many countries, government is beginning to be refashioned or has been for quite a few years now around identification, identifiers, and personal accounts. Now, I think there's, well, there's some risks with that, but there's some good sides to it. And this is part of re reinventing government as a platform, which has been a 20, 30 year project. But if those do become the glue of much of the state and interactions between the state and the citizens, actually those need new institutions to make sure that is done well, data isn't abused, there are protections and so on. And then more broadly, I, so many of you will have heard me talk in the past about uh, the weirdness that we have a, 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 a private sector economy much more organized around data and knowledge. The most valuable companies in the world now are nearly all organized around data and knowledge. And yet in the public sector, we have very little comparable. And at a global level, we have very little comparable. So we have an IMF, an International Monetary Fund, a World Bank, but nothing similar on data and knowledge and its orchestration. And I think this will become core to the work of governments in the next 10 or 20 years, getting the right data, the right knowledge of all kinds to the right, <laughs> and the right uses at the right times. And with that, again, we will need quite a lot of institutional innovation. I, a few years ago, published some proposals on how we might organize data trusts to curate, organize things like transport data and health data in a city, in a nation. We still don't have any of those. And that creates all sorts of problems of distrust and uh, mismanagement. There's then a series of institutional innovations about how to work with the people. Again, the kind of co-creation Pierre was talking about. We are seeing a, an explosion of experiment around all forms of citizens assemblies, not just at a national level, but at a transnational level. And this has got be you know, a large part of what happens in the near future, the reinvention of democracy to tap into all the different kinds of intelligences of the public, not just of elected representatives and so on. There's then a whole series of institutional, missing institutions around, around innovation. Um, uh, social science parks, I'm in a university, all universities have their science parks, almost none yet have an equivalent to mobilize social science, sociology, uh, psychology, economics uh, to uh, help solve problems. We have missing institutions around social R&D, an excellent report from um, Taxi uh, not long ago. Uh, that. Um, and it's not surprising that our social innovation language is behind scientific and tech innovation because it doesn't have the institutional structures, the living labs, accelerator labs of the kind UNDP is doing, test beds and so on, to make that part of someone's job to be constantly testing out better ways of tackling homelessness or youth unemployment or poor housing. And then finally, I've long been interested in how you might reshape the center of a government to better fit the needs of now. And these are generally quite conservative institutions uh, organized in ways which made sense 50 years ago or even 100 years ago. But there are actually different options now of how to combine the unavoidable tasks on 
political management, legislation, media, but also to tap into social media, data, and the steering of big transitions like the transition to, to net zero. So there are many other examples. Um, uh, to me, these are all sort of bureaucratic innovations and reforms in a good sense. It's striking to me that in business, it's kind of taken for granted you reorganize regularly, often slightly madly regularly within businesses. The public sector finds it much harder to get rid of old institutions and to recombine itself. But I think the final point I'd end with, uh, again, it echoes what Pierre said, is we probably need some at least of our institutions to be significantly more, um, more contingent, more easily reassembled around changing tasks, whether it's an emergency like a, a, a pandemic or, 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 or new functions. They were literally was set in stone in the late 19th century in grand siloed departments. There is no need to organize in quite such rigid ways in the 21st century when, as I say, platforms, digital and knowledge are the foundations of running any, any system. And that spirit, I think, of, of, of redesign and recombination in response to the most compelling task of the time perhaps is the, is the, the key sort of takeaway idea. Um, so thanks, Jesper, for sort of giving, setting the challenge. Uh, and um, yeah, let's see what responses there are. Oh, there's a few chats already. Oh my God. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and, and once again, obviously, um, big topic, uh, so many angles on this, um, but great to have your sort of ideas and visions as a part of this uh, sort of vantage point uh, for this conversation. Um, Pia, uh, yeah, as, as Jeff was mentioning, there are already many questions in the chat, so we'll get to those, but I want to give you an opportunity to just uh, reflect and, and ask a question. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Jeff, I really loved all of, um, all of what you said there, uh, a lot of uh, really um, uh, good, um, good things to ponder and to, to consider. So I guess a couple of questions for you. Um, the first one is um, uh, why, do, why do you think that um, the measurement system hasn't evolved to be more human centric? I mean, we've only seen a few jurisdictions create, um, you know, wellbeing frameworks or quality of life frameworks for measuring uh, impact. Um, and I, I mean, my hypothesis is that while ever you have a purely economic model for measuring impact, you're going to continue to inadvertently value money over people. Um, so, so where do you think that's at and, uh, and how can we accelerate the normalization of um, holistic measurement systems? That's, that's a great question. So I think I misjudged that. If you're moving in the right, so I'll stop video again, moving in the right direction. We had huge amount of work in the 2000s on wellbeing as a primary goal for national policies led by the OECD. In fields like health, there was much more attention to subjective experience, patient experience as, a, as alongside classic health measures. In fields like policing, much more attention to things like fear of crime as well as uh, crime itself. And it seemed obvious to me this would just become the new normal. But I think there's, that's one of many things, probably the financial crash plus austerity sort of froze a lot of um, a lot of progress in these things, and probably led to, in some ways, a reversion to a cruder sort of uh, view of metrics uh, and a version of economics which didn't take uh, lived experience seriously. So you're absolutely this is uncompleted business, but I, I still feel that is the direction of travel. Is in some ways it's to taking experience and psychology and life. Uh, much more seriously relative to the more traditional and material metrics of the world. Thank you. Um, just one, uh, well, I've got kind of two very quick follow-ups because I know there's a lot of other questions, but um, I guess the second one is how do you see us um, transitioning public sectors away from just straight up new public management? New public management seems to have been the mechanism by which we started shifting to more functional segmentation in our departments. And of course, functional segmentation has led to 
uh, huge barriers to multidisciplinary development, to program, you know, focuses, to outcomes focus, because everyone's just focused on their function. Um, but it also led to this massive existential crisis of public services, um, just, you know, too many public services seeing um, good work can only be done by people outside of the sector. And so, um, you know, the shift in, in procurement innovation is so important, I agree, but I, I, I'm a little afraid that too many governments will see uh, procurement as the solution, as the silver bullet, um, which then might actually accelerate the hollowing out of expertise uh, in the sector, um, um, you know, unless it's countered with a little bit more of that um, existential confidence of a public sector to see itself as part of society, not, you know, a problem to be resolved. Um, so I, I guess, how are you seeing that shift, if at all, uh, around the world uh, from new public management to something a bit more values-based or um, outcomes-based? Very weird. I actually remember a meeting which included the head of the New Zealand Civil Service, the Australian, the Canadian, and the British nearly 20 years ago, where the one thing they all agreed was the new public management was over. <laughs> and uh, it's most definitely not over 20 years later. Um, it has this sort of strange uh, afterlife. So just, or maybe two comments. One is, I think in some countries there has been quite a big shift back to in-house capability. Certainly on digital, it's clear if you outsource everything, you become really stupid. <laughs> Just as on procurement, if you outsource, you know, if you don't have very strong internal capability, you just spend money badly. So I think I think there has there is a, a readjustment there to much more focus on core capabilities of government. Where I think there's been less progress is on the other point you mentioned, which is horizontal structures alongside the vertical silos. And again, I thought much more would have changed on that by now, especially around things like net zero or inequality or business competitiveness, that we would have more often um, budgets, political authority you know, and, and sort of policy teams organized around the tasks with, as it were, the silo departments one layer down in the structure. Um, and that still seems to me a better way of running governments than being trapped in what is almost a late 19th century model of, uh, of, of verticals. Um, but again, perhaps this is one of those things where sort of the long economic crisis, which there's been for the last 12 years, has, has slowed down uh, progress, perhaps. And I think the other thing is perhaps we're still waiting for a generation within leadership positions in public services who are completely comfortable with digital. Because if you take for granted sort of digital thinking, then it's obvious you, you organize in sort of much more horizontal ways rather than vertical ones. But I still think we probably haven't yet got in most countries the first generation right at the top who sort of grew up immersed in a, in a platform world. Uh, thanks for that. I, um, I'll, I'll leave with just one last comment then and we'll go to everyone else. Um, my observation is that as people rise through the ranks into the senior executive layer, they are pressured and encouraged to forget any domain experience or knowledge that they have and just become generalists. So, so one of the worst uh, impacts of NPM is um, a, a huge amount of um, um, managers who don't know how to lead or maintain a, a vision um, uh, across our public sectors. So there's a real challenge there, I would suggest. Um, and um, uh, hopefully one that's starting to improve in, in um, some places. Uh, so my final questions, you, you mentioned about AI um, and about how to create, you know, more ethical sort of humane approaches. Um, how do you see, I guess, reimagining um, a, a, the basic principles of administrative law, which uh, several of our jurisdictions have as a, as a, as a concept um, in the digital age, uh, you know, uh, making sure that, if a, if a decision is made by a human or AI or anything else, um, just making that traceability, that appealability, auditability, um, where are you seeing the best examples of, um, of assuring trustworthy decision-making regardless of what it's made by? Jeff? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And I think um, we almost need both a new theory of algorithm that we learn from the practice you say. All decisions are being algorithms, uh, fines, tax, uh, charging for help. School exams was a big issue in the UK last year. There are other people usually going to humans. Uh, in, uh, in various structures, like in social security in Canada is a good example. Um, in others, there isn't. It's very hard to get to explainability. This, is in the this was part of the EU law, but some algorithms aren't explainable to the people working on them. Um, so I think we will need, as I say, a new sort of almost meta theory of algorithms. It's like the UK as a semi-regulator are working on parts of that. But I've been very disappointed how little good work has been done in universities. We flesh out practical we have ethics centers all over the world, but they're not working on the much more immediate practical questions of government design which you're mentioning which are, are really urgent now great thanks both uh to um to kind of keep keep on the, this dynamic of, of going back and forth i think yeah uh, just enjoying uh kind of what comes to mind at this at this point um i did want to quickly uh, and we only have around 15 minutes left so so i want to quickly see if we can touch upon a few of the questions in the in the chat um uh, I'm going to try to combine two, which may not do them justice, but, but apologies in advance. So Margie and Ivy, uh, one is uh, talking about uh, or asking about the relationship between uh, politics and the bureaucracy. Um, and the other one uh, is talking about uh, how do we create space for, for proactive government. And, and uh, a, a personal current experience for me, um, sitting, I'm spending two days a week sitting in a ministry in Denmark, uh, trying to help them build it a new capacity strategy. Um, and that that's basically what they want. They want to be proactive. Um, but when, when, you know, these conversations are being had, most people say, well, we don't have the mandate to be proactive, because the mandate comes either from a central department or from the political level. Uh, and obviously then, you know, there's a pragmatic question of you, you, you can sort of try to follow some of the political wins, if you will, to see if there isn't a window of opportunity somewhere, but, but that's not really what we're talking about here, which is, you know, in a way, how, how do we create the institutional resilience, uh, you know, learning orientation, not just to learn about the current political agendas, but also what's needed in the future. So. I wonder if both of you um, can kind of reflect on, on those two questions in, in, in combination. Um, Pia, do you want to maybe start? Well, there was a lot of questions in there. <laughs> so so let, me, let me try to, to tackle a couple. Um, politics. Um, here's my philosophy, and it's not necessarily always the most popular one, but it has served me well. Um, the, the, the role of the public service is not just to serve the government of the day. That is a myth. Uh, it is not true. Um, the role of the public service is to serve three masters, the government of the day, the parliament, and the people. Um, and in the case of, uh, and, and of course, there's a bit of difference in different jurisdictions. Here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, there's a treaty, which is actually one of the foundational constitutional artifacts um, of this country, and the treaty is very clear that uh, governance should be a, um, a shared responsibility between the Crown and Māori. So there's a whole other layer there on top of that. So, um, so I guess the public sector, when the public sector sees itself as only serving the Minister of the Day, it actually makes co-design with the public impossible. Uh, because, well, Minister says X, so we have to do X, even if it's not Y. And then the, the public service just becomes a communications mechanism to say, well, Minister wants to do X, so we need to figure out how to convince you that X is the right thing to do, even if it is or isn't. Um, so the, the way to get that balance is, um, from my perspective, 
if you just serve one of those three pillars, government, parliament, people, if you only serve one at the expense of the others, you will not be able to serve any of them sustainably with integrity or with trust. You will lose the trust of all of them. If you serve all of them and try to keep it reasonably equal, and I wrote a whole bunch of articles about this, I'll put a link in the, in the chat. If you try to serve them all relatively equally, you, have, um, you will have a grudging respect <laughs> from all of them and the ability to serve all of them well. So, um, that, um, so that becomes a balancing act and a pressure for sure. Uh, at the end of the day, the government of the day are the representative, um, you know, government, they are the elected representatives. They are the ones that will make the, will be the final decision makers on a whole bunch of policy decisions for, for, for sure. But at the same time, the vast bulk of what a public service does at any point in time is usually not touched by the government of the day. They, their policy decisions will pivot and twitch, you know, 20, 30, 40% of the operations of government. Most of it, you know, is already bound in the constitution, in uh, regulation, in legislation, in case law, in operational policies. Um, so the public service needs to, um, you know, uh, do its job um, to, to, rep to again, be those stewards of sustainable long-term public good, not just doing what the minister of the day says. So that's the answer to that one. That's a very tricky thing to hear and to say. Uh, and I can give you plenty of stories where um, holding that line, um, even in a senior executive role for me, um, has actually um, been, a, you know, created an excellent relationship with a minister who wants to hear. They, they want to hear the truth. They want to hear, here's what the data says, here's what the facts are. They want to have those briefs. And some ministers will choose to ignore them. That's their prerogative, but it's our, um, it's our job to be frank and fearless in, in seeking and providing well-informed positions. Um, on, the, on the rest, I'm sorry, I've sort of lost it a little bit, but um, what else did you want us to cover, sorry, Jesper? It was more linked to the proactive government. Maybe we should- uh, Oh, just proactive government. So the, I got two, two, two tactics for you. Let's get really tactical for a second. Um, the first one is what I call proportional planning. Um, whether um, at, at a highest level, at a program level, at a project level, at a day-to-day -day team running level, at a personal level, um, making sure that you always build into your planning a proportion of time for innovation and exploration is key. Not just being focused on the latest deliverable, the latest fast value, but always being focused on something around long value and around um, planning innovation. I like to create 10% playtime in every team that I build. And, um, and that just creates time to think, time to reflect, time to innovate, time to explore what's possible. And, um, and just having a little time to think creates much more high performing teams, much more confident teams, much more innovative teams, and frankly, a lot better outcomes uh, on everything that we do. Um, and people that sort of say, oh, well, we can't possibly do that unless I get more money. No, if you've got a dollar or a billion dollars, <laughs> doesn't matter what you've got, Freeing up 10% is absolutely within your remit. And when your boss or your minister says, well, I want it all hands on deck on this, you still can say, no, <laughs> I'll still deliver the thing you want, but this is how I operate my ship. Um, so um, you, you have to create the space. Um, the, 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 the pressures around us will suck 110% of our time and effort. Um, given the opportunity, you've just got to have the discipline of actually um, doing proportional planning. Thanks, Peter. Uh, anything to add, Jeff? Yeah, I completely agree with that. So just on the, the sort of two points, one is I think everyone has a duty beyond the mandate of their government, uh, exactly as Pierre said. But you can also think of this as your duty to the people in your job in 10 years' time. You have a duty to act now in ways which will leave better conditions for them, uh, which includes trying things out, innovation, sometimes which will not have a political mandate from your bosses. But all over the world, this is a very normal situation. People learn how to do things below the radar. They learn guile to make it acceptable to their bosses and just get on with stuff. I think the current political masters. And in a way, it relates to the other question. How one of the, the bills Biden is passing this year was originally going to be called the Endless Frontier in memory of Vannevar Bush, who in the 1940s almost invented the US science system 
institutionalized, large scale, very expensive innovation. Um, and his insight then was that if you didn't institutionalize it, you wouldn't win wars, you wouldn't defeat the Soviet Union. And we need the equivalent on all the other kinds of innovation um, Pierre mentioned. They have to become part of someone's job. And then also in every part, these percent or 20 percent. But if you don't do that and ensure also in your minister's agenda that they are devoting at least some time to the longer term, the tyranny of the immediate will actually lead you to make bad decisions and act in ineffective ways. And this is true of every organization. Again, this is being a good public servant is being a guardian of the long term as well as the medium term and the short term. If you only do the long term, then you're useless at your job. If you only do the short term, you're equally useless. Thank you. Um, so I am mindful of time, and there's, the, you know, I suspect there's too many questions to be able to cover in, in this this uh, time. But feel free to to use the chat to to address some of them if you want, Ian and Jeff. Uh, I'll I'll end on on a on a contemporary one. Uh, so there's a question around how we actually, and there's a bit of a paradox in, in that question, I think, how do we create space for innovation in crisis? Um, on the one hand, I guess you should say, you know, that, that goes with the territory, you know, we have to innovate when in crisis. And I guess we've seen uh, a lot of that happening uh, in, in the COVID times, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, we are seeing, uh, you know, in many respects, uh, you know, things going back to normal, uh, there's a cry for some places that you want to continue or you want to maintain some of those ways of working that were relevant in that crisis time. Um, and on the other hand, we have the, the, the opposite narrative, which is, you know, we don't have the, the way, we don't have the innovative ways to, um, to work in, in the ways that are necessary to deal with the crisis. So in a way, we have these two competing or two paradoxical worlds that, that, that decision makers are living in. Uh, and here I'm, I'm just asking you um, to kind of reflect uh, on the COVID, on where we are and what we've been with, with, with the COVID crisis, what you've seen and what we've learned about that question of, of how to create space for innovation in, in crisis or you called around sort of those constant crisis uh, scenarios as you were talking about here as well. Um, COVID, uh, I'll Okay, I'll jump in, sorry. COVID did something very extraordinary and very interesting. It created a paradox. Um, on one hand, it uh, created a huge pressure on the system. Um, it, it, it absolutely exposed inequities um, because with all that extra pressure, all the traditional levers and programs and methods did not scale. Uh, the, the ability to respond to and um, and address causal factors, identify patterns as they were happening and respond to them. Um, you know, we, 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 we saw an absolute um, mess, um, you know, and a lot of departments, you know, absolutely were heroes in trying to stand up and, and do the best they could, but fundamentally inequity was just absolutely exploded. Um, uh, at the same, so, so it created um, a demand for change an absolute demand for change. But at the same time as creating this massive demand for change, as we all you know, saw things just not work, um, all the resources were put into all the same old levers because, oh, we just need to do, do this thing, just need to do this thing. So what I've seen come out of COVID is two types of, um, I'm not usually a dichotomist person, but I have seen two things come out of it. I've seen governments who come out saying, as the Minister for Homelessness in Pakistan said, like it, it, um, there was a massive conference about, you know, governing in the era of rolling emergencies right throughout Southeast Asia. And most of the Southeast Asian governments were saying, it's not feasible or desirable to go back to the status quo because it wasn't working. Um, and there's gonna be more emergencies and we need to actually transform ourselves. We need to reform ourselves. We need to reimagine ourselves in this context so that we can be effective. And then there's other governments who are like, when are we getting back to normal? Um, because normal was perceived to be working. And, um, and so, um, in fact, Australia and New Zealand are the only places in the world that I've heard someone say, um, oh, you know, um, thing, things, um, things got slowed down because of COVID. I'm like, really? In Canada, things got accelerated because of COVID. That's, that's an interesting perspective. Um, so I, I think that um, COVID placed a huge amount of pressure to, to, to reform 
And um, it's really up to um, all of us now as to whether that pressure is, is um, leveraged for the renewal and transformation, which is absolutely required to the reforms that's required, or whether it's just, you know, blurred into the memory of, um, oh, well, we did that thing back in COVID, but now we can get back to normal. Um, it's really incumbent on all of us to not let that latter situation come about. Thanks, Pierre. Final, final comment from you, Jeff. Yes, I agree with that. I think maybe three comments. One is there was all over the world extraordinary innovation in government in COVID, uh, very messy, inventing tests, trace, mass rapid vaccination, business support, family support, handling lockdowns. These all needed new methods. And most governments actually handled it quite well. We've now got really two questions which lie ahead. One is, what do we keep from the crisis? So, for example, huge experiment in online learning. You know, what? how should our school systems be different in a year's time because of what's been done in COVID? Most will try and go back to the previous status quo. And then there's also an issue on the inquiries into the pandemic and how those look at deeper Use. So, for example, in some countries like the UK, how national government relates to the devolved administrations and local government So, uh, I was put in the chat this. Uh, IPO, which is the International Public Policy Observatory on COVID. We're trying to look at examples, but also how the inquiries are organized to ensure they are societal learning exercises, not just narrow traditional sort of blame games. Um, because otherwise, as Pierre said, we will revert to a, a dysfunctional previous normal rather than using the crisis to, to leap ahead. Thanks so much, uh, Jeff and Pia. Uh, this was an amazing and inspiring scene setting um, for the next three days. Uh, and, uh, you know, so many angles and, and, and avenues and, and agendas to follow up on. And I will believe that we will certainly pick up on, on several of them in, in the next three days uh, as part of this learning journey uh, that's ahead. Um, I hope James will just share the, the program as, as, as it's coming. Um, but for now, and these are some of the themes that you can look forward to later today, we'll be talking about uh, public spending, um, we'll talk about action research and, and how that's developing or, or evolving. Um, uh, tonight, um, CET, we will talk about what is actually characterizing the, the very modern public servant. Um, and uh, tomorrow and onwards, uh, we'll talk both about sort of learning organizations, uh, functions and labs of the future. Um, Jeff mentioned the social R&D ecosystems. We'll, we'll, we'll hear from Taxi and, and, and the Canadian government tomorrow night on, on that, uh, you know, innovating public policy uh, and talking also about the, this very hyped agenda around missions and whether they're actually, uh, you know, are the answer to everything or, or what else we should be considering when, when talking about the new approaches in, in, in the institutional innovation element. For now, just thank you so much, Pian and Jeff, and thanks for everyone for uh, for taking part in this uh, intro. Um, uh, looking forward to hopefully seeing many of you uh, as the as the week comes along. But have a great day or night uh, wherever you are, and uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs>